Okay, so today I want to start talking about the conditional. Um, the conditional is just a fancy way of saying if then, right? If A then B. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time on the conditional. You guys might be asking, well, why are we going to spend a lot of time on the conditional? Well, because it's a bit more complicated and a bit more interesting in some ways than the other stuff we've been talking about, right? I went pretty slowly through disjunction and negation and all that because, you know, I think this idea of, you know, translating ordinary English into symbolic logic is, it's a little foreign, right? It takes some practice. But I think the basic ideas with conjunction, with negation and disjunction aren't too hard, right? They're pretty intuitive ideas, and really with these statements, it's not that common we make mistakes. Conditionals are a bit more complicated. There are a few different valid forms of argument we make using conditionals, and there are also a few fallacies, right? Fallacies being things that look like they're valid, they look like they're valid forms of argument, but they're not. So, because there's a couple forms of valid argument that use conditionals and a couple closely related fallacies, that's one reason I think it's important to spend a lot of time to go pretty slowly with the conditional. Um, one other reason is that it turns out that using the conditional translating ordinary English into symbolic logic will often prove to be a bit tricky. And I think it proves to be a bit tricky because the logic of how we use conditionals in ordinary language, in ordinary argument, turns out to be a lot more complicated, a lot trickier than we realize. So I think this translation stuff that I'm going to spend a lot of time on with the conditional will help to untangle to make a bit more sense, to make clearer the logic of conditional statements in ordinary language. I think that will be pretty helpful. That's really my main goal with all this symbolic logic stuff is to help us pay more attention and get better at, pay more attention to and get better at the arguments we make in ordinary language. Okay, so with all that, you know, preparation out of the way, let's get into actually talking about the conditional and what it means. Well, so the first thing to see is just the symbol we use for the conditional. Um, now, your book actually uses this little horseshoe symbol. Um, I'm actually going to use an arrow symbol, right? Now, now look, in, in logic, different books will use different symbols. A fair number use the horseshoe. A lot use the arrow. I think... I'm not sure about this. I think a lot of older books use the horseshoe and newer ones tend to use the arrow. Your book is pretty new, new edition. I think most written these days probably use the horseshoe. These guys are kind of a holdover. Um, I'm going to use the arrow, even though your book uses the horseshoe for a couple reasons. I, I prefer the arrow. Um, one reason is that if you ever do some advanced math, there's a symbol in math in set theory that looks like this horseshoe, and I think it's easy to confuse. So it's better if we just use different symbols, right? Most of you are never going to do that level of advanced math, so that doesn't matter to you, whatever, right? The main reason I prefer the horseshoe isn't that, though. The main reason is we're going to be using Canvas to turn this stuff in, and you're going to be using Word or in a lot of cases, Google Docs to write it. Well, I want to use symbols that are not too hard to find, not too hard to come up with in Google Docs or Word. Now, if you dig into Word and it's like little mathematical symbols part, you can find the horseshoe. Google Docs, I don't think has it, but it does have the arrow and Word has the arrow as well. So the arrow is just in more programs. That's one reason to prefer it. Also, if you're feeling lazy or if you just can't find it, you can just make up the arrow with this little dash dash um, 
you know, wedge on its side symbol, right? That's right there on your keyboard. I'm going to guess a lot of you do will do that. You can't do the same with the horseshoe symbol. So I'm going to use the arrow just because it's easier for a lot of us to type. That's 90% of it for me, but I think it is important. But putting it on the board, I actually have an easier time drawing the arrow too than I do the horseshoe. The horseshoe looks all weird, but not me drawing on the board, but anyway. Okay, so let's be really clear what we mean by, um, you know, the conditional statement, the little arrow, right? You know, let's just go through a few examples. If John went to the store, then we have eggs. J equals John went to the store. E equals we have eggs. J arrow E, right? If you have a black belt in jujitsu, you know how to defend yourself. B equals you have a black belt in jujitsu. D equals you know how to defend yourself. B arrow D, right? Final one, if the White Sox's fans riot, then the White Sox will forfeit the game. R equals the White Sox's fans will riot. F equals the White Sox will lose the game. Those of y'all who don't know much about baseball, probably wondering why I'm picking on the poor White Sox here. The White Sox actually had the, the, the very dubious distinction of being the, the last major league team to forfeit a game. They held this distinction for about 15 years, right? Look, this is neither here nor there to logic. I think it's funny, so I'm gonna go into it. Um, so if you're a major league team and you're hosting the game at your, you know, um, park, then if for whatever reason the game can't be played, you forfeit. Well, one reason you can't play the game is if your fans riot, which the White Sox's fans did. They had this not well thought out promotion in the 70s called Disco Demolition Night, where they were going to blow up a bunch of disco records on the field. Google it, it's a pretty funny story, suffice it to say, this did not go as planned and it ended with the fans riding on the field and little pieces of disco records everywhere, so the White Sox forfeited the game. Um, the White Sox are no longer the last team to forfeit a game. The Dodgers are, I think, now the last team to forfeit a game. They, um, they also had a stupid promotion where they gave the fans baseballs, right? And... Bill Veck, interestingly enough, the guy who owned the White Sox when their fans rioted and they forfeited the game, he always said, you know, never give the fans anything they can throw. They gave the Dodgers fans these baseballs. They were unhappy about a call, so they started pelting on people on the field with baseballs. Well, if they're throwing baseballs at your head, you can't very well play a baseball game. So they weren't able to continue the game, so the Dodgers forfeited because their own fans misbehaved, right? I don't know, whatever, that's neither here nor there to logic. I just think it's kind of hilarious when sports fans behave badly. That probably says something bad about me, but whatever. Okay. So, little bit of jargon we should learn with the conditional. The first part of a conditional statement is called the antecedent. The second part is called the consequent. So forfeit is just a fancy way to say lose. So let's just look at the statement. If the White Sox forfeit, they will lose the game, right? F equals the White Sox forfeit. L equals the White Sox lose the game. F arrow L, right? F is the antecedent. L is the consequent, right? Antecedent, the first thing on this, in front of this arrow, the consequent, the, you know, is the thing after the arrow. In ordinary English language, antecedent is the if, consequent is what comes after the then. You know, sorry, you know, I hate to make people learn jargon any more than is necessary, but this is necessary because, it, you know, we'll figure in a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about, especially next lecture when we look at some fallacies. Okay, 
So now look, the, the, the little logical connective, the symbol is supposed to model, is supposed to fit with our use of if, then in arguments, right? But whenever we're defining something, you know, the actual definition of anything in symbolic logic is going to be the truth table, right? So how do we define P arrow Q with a truth table? Well, we define it so that P arrow Q, if P then Q, is only false when P is true and Q is false. Now, if you think about ordinary language, that really fits with the way we use it, right? If I say, if this one thing happens, or this one thing is true, then this other thing is true, well, obviously, if the first thing happens and the second thing doesn't, or the first thing is true and the second thing isn't, then the conditional is just plain false, right? If I say to you, well, if you throw a baseball at this window, it will break, and you throw a baseball at him, and you shouldn't do that, but if you do, and for whatever reason it's plexiglass or whatever, the baseball bounces right off, P is true, you throw a baseball at it, Q is false, it doesn't break, well then obviously the conditional, if you throw a baseball at it, it will break, was also false, right? So that part of it fits the ordinary language. And think about this true, right? When P is false, and Q is true, the conditional is still true. That also fits with ordinary language a lot of the ways we use it, right? If I say, well, if you throw a baseball out a window and it'll break, well, that's still true even if P, you threw a baseball at the window, is false and Q is true, right? Imagine somebody threw a rock at it and broke it. The conditional, you know, if you had thrown a baseball at it, it would have broken. That's still true, right? P arrow Q is also true when both P and Q are false. And that might seem a little weird to you guys to start with, but think of it this way, right? If I say, if you throw a baseball at the window, it will break. Well, even if you don't throw that baseball and the window remains completely untouched, if the window's made out of normal glass, well, that statement is still true, right? Even if P never happens, even if Q never happens, the conditional, if P were to happen, then Q would, is still true, right? Okay. So hopefully that all makes sense to, to you guys. The important thing to know, P arrow Q is true in every case for every possibility of P or Q, except when P is true and Q is false. Other three possibilities for P and Q, the symbol P arrow Q is true. Okay, now before we leave this behind, I want to talk about some logical equivalences, right? And logical equivalence, remember, two statements are logically equivalent if they always have the same truth value which is a fancy way of saying when one is true, the other is always true. When one is false, the other is always false. You know, we'll look at the truth table in a second. You know, on every line of the truth, if two statements are logically equivalent on every line of the truth table, when one has a T, the other one will have a T. When one has an F, the other one will have an F, right? Well, look, it turns out that both not P or Q, and this other statement here, which is a little harder to say, but we can say the statement, it is not the case that both P and not Q turn out to be equivalent to if P then Q. Well, why is that? Well, the first part of why that is, is just that, you know, if we look at the truth table, how we define these statements, not P or Q, and this statement, it is not the case that P and not Q are true in every case where if P then Q is true and they're false in the one case 
where it is false, right? On the second line of the table, all three statements are false, and on every other line of the table, they are true. Same truth values, they're logically equivalent. So for the purposes of symbolic logic, they mean the same thing. Well, now no, no look. If I had asked my logic professor, you know, why that is, he was kind of a jerk. He'd have just pointed at the truth table like I was too stupid to read T's and F's, right? Really didn't like my logic teacher. Hopefully you guys will not say the same thing about me. And, and I think, you know, this guy just was being a jerk and he was being impatient and he was being a poor teacher because remember, our statements our symbols are supposed to fit with the logic of ordinary argument. So I think it is important that the way we ordinarily use these terms kind of fit with the equivalences. And if you think about it, for the it is not the case that A and B statement, it is pretty natural to think that that does mean the same thing as if A then B. I mean, think of it this way, right? Imagine you come to me and you say, well, I'm worried about passing the class, right? And I say, look, if, if you just do your work, there is no way you'll fail this class. If you just do your work, you will pass. And you say, really? You know, imagine you said to me, really? I'm, I'm not so sure. And I say, well, you know, maybe I say something like, well, look at the syllabus. J just look at the way things are set up. It simply isn't possible that you do your work and you fail the course. Well, in that second statement, which is just me restating the conditional, if you do your work, you will pass. Well, you know, what I'm saying is it simply is, you know, it's not the case that you can both do your work and not pass the class, right? We don't normally talk that way. It's roundabout just sounds weird, we use a lot of knots that are confusing, but I think it is pretty natural to think that we can rephrase it using ands and nots, what we're saying if then. So the idea that if A then B means the same thing as it is not the case that A and not B, that doesn't seem weird to me, right? That, that does capture the logic of how we use these statements. You know, or if you say, well, if John said he will do the shopping, then he will do it. Well, that means the same thing as a statement that says, well, John wouldn't say he would do it and not do it, right? Again, it is not the case that John would both say he'll do the shopping and then, you know, and not do the shopping, right? Okay. Anyway, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but hopefully that makes sense, you know, not just the truth table that says these two are equivalent, when we really think about the la logic of ordinary language, these two really do mean the same thing. Now look, it is much less obvious why we should think if A then B means the same thing as not A or B, right? These two statements don't seem to mean the same thing in ordinary language. There doesn't seem to be a conflict between the two of them, right? It's just weird to think they mean the same thing. Now look, one thing I could say to you as well, just use De Morgan's laws, right? We've already seen that the it is not the case that A and not B statement means the same thing as if A then B. And if you use De Morgan's rules, remember, you know, you in a sense distribute this little not symbol and turn the and into an or. Well, if you do that, then you get not A or B out of it. That still doesn't seem entirely satisfying to me because then we're, you know, we're drifting back into symbolic logic land when the in course, the initial question was, well, does this fit the way we use ordinary language? Um, keep that question open. I will come back to it. When we start talking about modus tollens and arguments by refutation, especially which we will in a couple weeks, I think it will make sense why these two statements do turn out 
to be equivalent. Keep the question open. I think there's a good answer for it. We need to get a little bit more on the table to see what that answer is.